Thank you very much. Patrick, Tom, thank you for your long help on this issue. Um, I started this in uh, January of this year, uh, never imagining that we would be here 41 days uh, from the expiration of the guarantee that President Maliki, Prime Minister Maliki has given us. 41 days. We have wasted nearly 300 days because the government of the United States of America could not get off its butt and figure out what we stood for as a country. And that is fundamentally wrong. I want to talk first about the United Nations. The United Nations made, in my view, a courageous vote and admitted, UNESCO admitted the Palestinians as a member nation of UNESCO. For that, the law in the United States demands that they be uh, prevented from getting any contributions from our Congress. It's about 20 percent of their budget. Now, I generally think the United Nations is an institution that's important in the world. And I'm, I think it's a mistake to defund them. But yesterday, the person who is representing the United Nations made the ridiculous suggestion that the people from Ashraf be redistributed inside Iraq and that somehow, without any guarantee of protection either from the United States or the United Nations, they would be fine. How can I go to the Congress of the United States and ask them to restore the money for the United Nations if this kind of cowardly policy is what we get in return from the United Nations? We can do better than this, and I ask the representatives of the United Nations to think about what they are doing. We expect, in return for our, our investment in the United Nations, we expect courage. And we have seen virtually none of it from the UN in protecting these 3,500 individuals in Ashraf who have written guarantees, every single one of them, from the United States government that we would protect them and who have been screened by the Federal Bureau of Investigation's anti-terrorist squad and not one of them has been found to have terrorist connections. Explain to me, Martin Kobler, what rationale you give for what you have done, which is essentially to sign the execution okay for 3,500 unarmed civilians. That is not what the United Nations is supposed to be doing. Now, for Maliki, that's to occur in the White House. I understood that White House visits were a status symbol, something that was very important to the people who were getting them a sign of recognition that these are important countries. We have not mentioned that Prime Minister Maliki is under investigation by the Spanish judiciary for war crimes which occurred in Ashraf in April of 2011. How is it that the President of the United States is now inviting a person who is being invested, investigated for war crimes to come and sit? in the Oval Office. That Oval Office does not belong to the President of the United States. It belongs to every one of us Americans, and we need to be proud of the people that sit in it. There is not any question that the Prime Minister sent Iraqi troops into Ashraf on April 11th of, April 8th of 19 of 2011, and that 36 Ashrafi were murdered in cold blood by the troops that were sent by Maliki. That means that if that evidence turns out to be true, and I believe it is true, that he will in fact be convicted in the Spanish courts of war crimes. I believe that Nouri al-Maliki, the man who we enabled to be elected Prime Minister of Iraq, is a war criminal. The United States government needs to pay attention. We get reassured that they are paying attention. It is not enough to say you are paying attention. We have 41 days left. 3,500 unarmed people in the desert in Iraq charged, told by the American government that they were going to be protected in writing. We have an obligation here. I understand that the ambassador has said, well, we 
We want to be helpful, but we don't have a responsibility. Mr. Ambassador and Mr. President, we do have a responsibility. We gave our word and we gave it in writing. We have a responsibility. It is a legal responsibility. I do not want my country to be complicit in the carrying out of war crimes. As the Dutch found out in Srebrenica, people who turn the other way are complicit. Which brings me to the penultimate point. I don't know why the MEK is still on the terrorist list. There are some smart lawyers here who are going to, I'm sure, tell you that it shouldn't be, and I don't think it should be either, but I'm not a lawyer. But I do know that there is not much evidence that I can see. No one has presented evidence to the Congress. No one has presented evidence to the intelligence committees behind closed doors. No one has presented any evidence in public or private, as I understand from members of the Intelligence Committee, that the terrorist justification for the MEK is either justified or legal. So there's only one explanation, which is that somehow the administration believes that if we keep them on the terrorist list, that the mullahs will be nice to us. Well, first of all, this is a failed part foreign policy. I know the State Department has a long history of defending their mistakes. They're 15 years old. And this is another example of it. Somehow in 1997, we thought the mullahs might not send IEDs and blow up our troops, create atomic weapons, subsidize terrorism in the Middle East and all over the rest of the world. Somehow we thought if only we'll designate these folks and put them on the list, maybe the mullahs will be nice. It is 14 years later. I don't detect any niceness. In effect, we have ceded the creation of our foreign policy towards the nation of Iran to the mullahs who run Iran instead of the people who ought to be designing our State Department, which is the uh, policy, foreign policy, which is the president of the State Department. Now, I'm in this for two reasons. I'm in this because I think a terrible injustice is being done to 3,500 people, 3, people who we promised to keep safe. And I believe the United States is a great nation and that we have to keep our word. But I'm in this for a bigger reason than that. The real reason I'm in this does not have much to do with Ashraf, and it doesn't have much to do with the MEK. It has to do with the United States of America. This country was founded on the notion that we are raising the bar on expectations of what human beings were all about 235 years ago. If you look at the, I don't, I'm not a big fan of this American exceptionalism stuff. I don't think Americans are better than or Asians or South Af Americans or Africans or anybody else. But I do think we're an exceptional nation because of the content of our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Because those documents set forth something that had never been done at that time. And so there are still some things in our Constitution that protect people that aren't in any other Constitution in the world, mostly protection of political minorities, political minorities, not ethnic minorities because that is in a lot of other constitutions. What that means is the United States of America has stood as a beacon for the rest of the world. We don't, even always, we don't always live up to our own standards, but we have a high standard of what our obligation is to our fellow man. The reason people have, even amidst our failings, admired the United States is because we were willing to expect more of ourselves as a nation. That is what is at stake here. How we are willing to act on what we can expect for ourselves. We started this 341 days ago, at least when I got involved, and you started this long before that. Mr. President, we need to act now, not just for the people in Ashraf, not just because we are wanting to stand up and have regime change in Iran. We need to act now because we are standing up for our own country when we, understand, when we stand up for the people in Ashraf. And if we fail to do that, we have not just com being complicit in the murder of 3,500 people who we promised to defend. 
We are complicit in debasing our own country, and I do not believe that any American president ever should be part of that.